others. May we put aside our own personal interests, work with integrity and openness, striving to create a community that supports its people, its environment. Let us, in a moment of quiet, focus on why we are here. We give thanks for the wisdom of the past, look for opportunities in the present, and accept the challenges of the future. Tene te mihi, ke koutou katoa. Thank you. All right, welcome to the ordinary meeting of council um, this day, Thursday, the 16th of July. Uh, we will start with apologies. I have apologies from Her Worship Mayor Wise and Councillor Tanya Wright. Do I have a mover for that? Uh, Councillor Taylor and Councillor Crown. All those in favour? Aye. 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 Against? Carried. Uh, do we have any declaration of conflicts of interest? Right, there being none, we will move on to our public forum. And I'd like to welcome Prima Volta to come up. Guys, if you'd like to come up and introduce yourselves. Um, the ladies are going to speak to us about where they, are, where they are at, how the year has treated them, and how they are moving forward. Welcome. Thank you very much. Morena, Team Napier. Um, this is Team Prima Volta, in essence. Uh, although your engagement uh, locally might be with much younger faces, which is really how we like it. Uh, so we would have liked to bring uh, our young singers here today to, to present to you, but today is a very in important day for our organisation because it's the first day, first rehearsal day of the new cohort of the Project Prima Volta programme. So my name is Anna Pierard, uh, our co-founder, along with Sarah Wormsley here on my left, my very close left. <laughs> uh, we're very used to sharing a microphone, but we'll just pass between uh, between us to explain a little bit about our kaupapa, our purpose uh, and reason for being, to try and add value to this community in a way that reflects our own passion and expertise. So... <laughs> Perfect. We have just a couple of props, and I think, as Anna said, we uh, um, are much more keen to explain and, I guess, share some of the journey of, of PPV, Project Prima Volta, or uh, the Prima Volta Charitable Trust. Um, so we founded seven years ago, um, basically with the belief that the two of us over a coffee that, you know, we had a, a real opportunity to use music as a tool to create social change. Um, we'd both had really fantastic experiences singing um, both locally and around the world. We were lucky enough to be in the National Youth Choir together. Um, and so we came um, back to New Zealand after, um, you know, periods living in Europe and, and further afield. Uh, and decided that, you know, there was something really powerful in the experience we'd had and we wanted to, to share it. So we formed um, the Prima Volta Charitable Trust and alongside Festival Opera, uh, the opera company which some of you may know and have come to our operas in Art Deco weekend. Um, so we created those two to essentially provide the opportunity for young people to find their voice. So finding voices and shaping futures. And Festival Opera really enables us to provide that performance platform to our young people. So uh, over the seven years, um, we've developed our... <laughs> do my little wave. Uh, we've developed our model, and I guess um, what's really exciting for us is that, you know, we started, you know, with just a very basic um, premise about we felt there was something good in music. What we've discovered really is that music is a great vehicle for well-being. And so as we've evolved um, through Project Prima Volta, which is sort of our flagship program, that's teenagers um, who come together weekly and to share um, singing, share singing, learn skills, um, you know, understand about, you know, different, different um, young people in their neighbourhood. So it's a very diverse group of kids. Um, and we're really excited to have just recently uh, launched PPV Junior. So we have a new, co new cohort um, alongside PPV of 60 young people um, who are around about ages 10 to 14, so we're, we're carrying on. Um, and of course our mission being that we use music to, to transform um, individuals, whānau and communities. Um, and so that's really what we want to talk to you a little bit more about today in terms of our plans. Maybe Anna can just talk a little bit about um, our lockdown experience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure if, if many of you uh, you know, bought a winning ticket over the lockdown period and, and managed to catch a lotto draw. But uh, 
We were approached by Lotto because we we are, have received some funding through Creative New Zealand to uh, to pull something together for their Mother's Day draw. So this uh, provoked a bit of work uh, and a real, really fantastic team ethic for for our young singers to present a video uh, as part of the the Lotto draw. And the experience for them helped us to appreciate just how incredibly important it is to all be in the same room because. Um, although we continued our rehearsing week on week online and via Zoom and also introduced one-on-one -on -one singing lessons which enabled us to connect even further with these, uh, with all of the individuals in the, in the team, we became very aware of how important it is to sing alongside each other. Uh, so the experience of pulling something together for, for a, a national lotto draw was really exciting and gave them a sense that they'd made a tangible uh, effort with an output. But we were very clear on the fact that actually they're, they're drawn to each other to be able to connect through singing. So it was fantastic to have the experience of not being able to have something that was so precious so that they're all clear on what the value is to them. Yeah. Uh, so uh, as described, we have um, sort of four key programs. And I think for us, uh, you know, we also involve PPV Lab, which for us is... Um, I, I suppose, feeds into our mission of, of wanting to enable children to have access to music education every day. So PPV Lab um, also uh, kind of enables us to, to support even younger kids in a school setting. Um, so we just wanted to, let, to give you a sense of the, the breadth of our program. Um, but what we're most interested to talk to you about today really is, I guess, our plan to support uh, the <coughs> Napier community to come back together in this kind of post-lockdown, slightly uncertain world that we live in, um, not really knowing uh, you know, what the future will bring economically, you know, where we will be, but most importantly, um, to have experiences to share together. So one of the things that Anna and I talked about over lockdown was uh, because we had to reform our whole plan kind of in the, in the you know, period of a couple of weeks, um, you know, we always anticipate we'll be presenting to audiences and, this, and immediately in lockdown we realised that might not be possible. Mm. So what we're really excited about is how can we come out of this period and provide wonderful community-based experiences through music um, and leveraging um, not only our kids who get up and, you know, sing absolutely beautifully, um, but also to work um, in partnership with the Napier Civic Choir and the Hawke's Bay Orchestra. Um, so we are wanting to talk to you about an idea that we've had around um, a, a wonderful community Christmas uh, concert. So I'll hand back. <laughs> Um, by that stage, we're confident that our two new groups of, of uh, rangatahi and tamariki will be ready for the stage mm. and ready to have the experience, the, for many, their first experience of working with a full 50-piece symphonic orchestra and ready to be up there and singing alongside in close contact with their young colleagues. And critically, and this is something that we, <clears throat> sorry, this is something that we understood through the process of uh, having lots of lots of children in the opera in February. Critically, having the opportunity to see that role modelling in the next generation above them, mm -hmm. and that peer, you know, to attain a peer-to-peer -peer kind of support and inspiration. So, we think everybody will be ready at Christmas to come together and celebrate what they can do, and how that how that and that sense of pride in what they can do uh, at, in a very high stakes kind of environment because you know singing with a full symphonic orchestra is, some, is quite a big deal and we know through our experience with PPV that it, that it is quite life changing for some kids because you know you ask someone to do something, it's my, my daughter has been afraid of dogs for years, I'm going a bit off topic but you'll <laughs> stay with me. And, uh, <laughs> You know, when she spoke to me very rudely during, you know, as we came out of lockdown, I said, you're very brave, Ava, you're very, very brave. How about uh, we go and take Dad's dog for a walk, you know, and let's see, you know, use it for something that's going to benefit you rather than, you know, result in punishment. <laughs> <laughs> and because my daughter likes a challenge, you know, she, she, did, she did it and she now can't live without that dog, so it's exhausting for me to have to drop her off every afternoon to Dad's to take the dog for a walk. So the consequence of that is that she's now had the experience of understanding that if she faces something that seems impossible, even if it's even if the motivation or the encouragement has come in an, in an, an interesting way, she can achieve it. And it's a different thing 
but it's also very similar. The lots of the kids who come into contact with us have no sense of this kind of high stakes experience performance in their lives. They might have never come into contact with classical music at all, not, not understand the dynamics of working in an environment like this. We want to get them to the point where they can feel an enormous sense of satisfaction and achievement from being uh, put to the test. And, and that sense of satisfaction. So it's not just about entertainment, it's not just about the audience, it's about that important transformation. Mm. Um, so in our work with um, at Napier Civic Choir, we will have the, the almost the full spectrum of our community presented on stage. So we'll have young, young kids as, as young as about sort of nine or ten, right up into our sort of more, more senior citizens who sing in the choir, um, you know, accompanied by the orchestra. And we just felt that it was, you know, a wonderful opportunity to offer um, an amazing celebration and experience for the, for the Napier community. So we would like to ask the council to consider um, bringing families together to showcase the best of local at Christmas time. And so um, what we're asking on the next slide, if possible, thank you, um, is we would love to ask for your support to, to put on a Christmas spectacular concert. Um, and we would really request that, um, that we could provide that for free of charge to the community um, because it's a... You know, it's quite a large undertaking to have that many, sort of more than 100 people involved in a concert like that. <coughs> but we would really like it not to be something that we're cost as a barrier. Uh, we want all of our community to be able to come together and celebrate. And so that's the, that's the ask for today, and that's what we're hoping that um, Council will get behind. And we promise that it will be um, something that uh, you'll be the envy of, of, you know, or of all the other councils around New Zealand. So... Thanks for your consideration. Any other comments, Anne? We've probably gone way over time. Apologies, yes. <laughs> yes, we have three minutes. Sorry. That's all right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you Thank very you. much, Anna and Sarah. What I'll do is just ask if any of the councillors have any questions for you, and we'll start with Councillor Taylor. Thank you. Um, thank you, ladies. Um, thank you. Possible venue for this? Mm. Well, we're hoping to work with the Municipal Theatre, the largest capacity. Oh, sorry, yeah. Indoor. Yeah. Thank you. Indoor, yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Vogue. Just another question about the venue. Um, mm. You would want it for the event, but would you also need it for the rehearsals? Yes. So how many, how many times do you think you might need it if you could... Got any idea? Yes, yep. We need, we need it for two days, not consecutive, during the course of the week before the, uh, the performance, yeah. So just two, two evening rehearsals, so it's not a, not a daytime activity. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Crystal. So would you sell tickets? Obviously, we can't fit the whole of Napier in there. No. <laughs> no. So it says subsidised tickets. So how are, we going, how are you going to plan to kind of divvy them out? Is it first in, first served? or? Yeah, well, I think that could be something uh, that is an, a decision that's made in agreement with our partners, be those, yeah. be those funders and subsidise, subsidisers or Napier Civic Choir and Hawke's Bay mm. Orchestra. I think... We want to make access very equitable, and mm. the priority would go to the to the whānau of everybody who's involved, especially if it's a first time experience. Mm -hmm. uh, there are close to a thousand seats in the Napier Municipal Theatre, mm. and our experience is that that the opportunity should sit with the people who've n never had the opportunity. That's what we're trying to address here. So mm. I think if this becomes an annual thing, <laughs> there's, mm -hmm. because of, because of demand. You know, there's no harm from our point of view. We're totally happy to manage that the site, the content side of things. Mm. So yeah. And just another question: um, How do you? How do children come to you? How do you select them? And um, so, so through through PPV Lab, which is uh, just just to clarify what we do there. So we 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 contract a music expert, a, mm. an educator, who's trained in primary school teaching and. Uh, a qualified music teacher, and and she goes into a, several schools. We're a couple in Napier um, uh, at the moment, and she works in the classroom, demonstrating the the pedagogy and also training the teachers at new entrant level. So, so that activity means that we build quite a strong relationship with those schools, and those schools are feeders into. Uh, our PPV, PPV Junior program, but also we advertise on Facebook, mm. send out newsletters, so, and and drop flyers into schools. Yeah. Oh. 
my favourite job. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, Councillor Barry, another question. question. Um, are you applying to creative communities, Napier, for funding for this? And are you making a submission to our annual plan to ask for some funding? We're not making a submission to the annual plan. We'd be applying to the recovery fund. Uh, we, uh, unfortunately, if we applied to creative communities, we would not be able to apply to Creative New Zealand Arts grants. <coughs> so, so we won't be applying to either either of those things. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, ladies. I was really pleased to see you mention the recovery fund at the end yeah. of the year. So you are in contact with our team of staff in yes. terms of yeah. making an application to that, so we should see it come through yeah. that forum. Yeah. Fantastic. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, We'll move on to announcements by the Mayor, um, which is obviously not here, none from myself, um, and a call for minor matters. Do we have any minor matters on the agenda, Councillor McGrath? Um, can we have an update, please, on the uh, Mariwa toilets, toilet block? Very exciting, isn't it? Thank you. We'll <laughs> note that. Um, any other minor matters, Councillors? No, lovely, thank you. Um, we will move on to announcements by management. Uh, Ms Henderson, Adele. Um, and through the Chair. Um, so as part of our um, considerations going through the COVID lockdown, um, we made a recommendation and a resolution of Council at the time to um, stop pre-selling our cemetery plots. Um, and because of the demand, and obviously you know, things haven't um, transpired you know, um, as bad as potentially what's happening around the rest of the world, um, we're making the recommendation to go back to make those pre-sales available again. And should things change, then we'll review that situation. But um, rather than doing a formal council paper, we've said that we'll, we'll put this as a um, management comment and um, put that recommendation on the table today. Thank you. So can I just um, ask a question around how we discuss that recommendation? Devora, do we need... Uh, do you need confirmation from council, Adele, of your recommendation, or you can do that under delegated authority? Um, the chair so we've also noted that we can um, go back you know if things change again so what we're saying is at this point in time we've actually had lower than normal demand for our um, <laughs> cemetery and um, you know so people have been healthier through this period anyway so we're still like to make that available right so what I'm hearing is we don't need a decision from council on that but I will ask if there's any questions on the management update no lovely everyone seems comfortable with that thank you Adele <coughs> Sorry, we can't hear. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we will just confirm the wording of the original resolution to make sure we're covered. I'm pretty sure that it was specifically linked to the COVID-19 response, um, in which case it um, sort of lapses immediately. Um, but we will come back and let council know if we specifically need to move um, a removal resolution, as it were. Fantastic, thank you, DV. Um, lovely. Is that the end of the announcements by management? Fantastic. Um, we'll move on to confirmation of the minutes. So can I have a mover that the draft minutes of the ordinary meeting of council held Thursday the 4th of June be confirmed as a true and correct record? And I'll take the second at the same time, which is the draft minutes of the extraordinary meeting of council held Thursday the 11th of June, uh, that those be confirmed as true and accurate as well. Do I have a mover for those? Councillor Simpson and Councillor Price. Uh, all in favour? Aye. Aye. Against? <laughs> Carried. Thank you. I now intend to move into the agenda items. Can I have a, a point of clarification, please? Point of clarification, Councillor Price. I've got a, a, I really want to question why the four items on the agenda items have not gone through the appropriate committees, and because um, I, I think that the uh, double debate is one of our one of our strengths and that's removed from this. I um, go to the Maori Consultative Committee, item two, and in the middle of it, it's got that we're removing decision of council uh, from standing committees. Um, that's the first I've heard of it when I read this paper. And um, it's a shot across the bows to me. We should know about that and we should Definitely double debate and probably even 
discuss it further. So, to me, they should all be going through their standing committees. The first one, the transport, we had none at our standing committee, so we weren't full. So that's my question about this. Thank you, Councillor Price, and I think we will go through and provide a response to that. I think it's a valid question. Um, Devorah, would you be the best one to answer in general about those, and then um, we can probably save the debate on the individual items to when we discuss them, um, but just speak to why those have not gone through our standing committees. Thank you, Councillor Simpson, for your generous sharing of the microphone. I'm a team player. <laughs> team Napier. Uh, thank you. Hopefully I can be heard. Um, thank you for your question, Councillor Price. Uh, I will take... So there are four items in question that have come through as new items to Council. Uh, two of those are based on timing, and part of that is because, as you'll be aware, we're heading into our... Uh, revised annual plan timing which mucks around with this entire next meeting round as well so you'll actually see a number of reports coming through to committees that they definitely don't meet the terms of reference for um, because we've um, had to overbook people and places and prosperous Napier with the annual plan. So there is a little bit of um, timing rejigging that's had to happen which is impacted on the two papers transportation strategy and the New Year's Eve funding to make sure that we can get the decisions of the council that we need in time. Uh, speaking to the two governance related papers, so that's the one that you specifically mentioned um, in relation to the mechanics, as it were, of the Māori committee uh, and the update of the local governance statement. Uh, so typically we do bring governance related things directly to council. Um, the mechanics of the Māori Committee is actually related to the governance structure, which you'll remember that you first adopted at the end of last year at a council meeting. Uh, the local governance statement, strictly speaking, doesn't need to come through to council, but we did agree that for more major, because it's a live document, but we did agree with council that for uh, larger updates, we would bring those through for visibility. Uh, do I need to go back through um, the mechanics of the Māori Committee or do you want to debate the... I think we'll take that at the time that we discuss sure. the paper, okay. the specific concerns raised by Councillor Price, but sure. does that answer your question, Councillor Price? Um, in it answers my question, but doesn't satisfy me. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, I think what we'll do, Debbie, is thank you. We'll take, um, we'll take your advice on that. And we, of course, have the ability to lay items on the table if that's the decision of council as well, assuming those two um, items don't have any significant time frame pressures. Um, so we can discuss that also when we move into, into debate on each item. Thank you. Answered, not comfortable. <laughs> Noted, thank you. Um, right, so um, I'd like to invite Sharon O'Toole. I think Sharon is coming to speak to us around our first item, the procurement strategy for the transportation projects, and possibly Robin Malley as well. Welcome. Just, just, Madam Chair, if you're comfortable, I can address the timing issue um, at, at the commencement and then hand back to Sharon to cover off the report. Is that...? I think that sounds like a good way to start. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, so, yes, certainly um, it's not usually the uh, desire of officers to bring reports direct to Council. Um, we have been under some pressure. Um, you, you'll see through the report that we haven't actually had an approved transport station procurement strategy um, with the agency uh, since we had one in 2010. Um, usually they're reviewed every three to four years. Um, we had noted that we needed to do one um, and we were underway. Uh, what we, we had a, a stay of execution, as it were, from the agency um, pending the results of our um, procedural audit, which occurred in August last year. Um, Unfortunately, we didn't actually get the results of that audit until February this year, uh, at which point we were 
under the gun to we were certainly towards the end of the the window for uh, providing the draft strategy to to the agency um, they they were comfortable with accepting uh, a draft strategy with uh, without council approval um, but they did request that that was done as as quickly as practically pros possible um, which is um, and with the, unfortunately with the dates we we had to bring it to this committee direct so through the chair I'll introduce the paper and and then provide an opportunity for questions depending on content that will either be to me or to Robin so NZTA requires that all approved organisations, i.e. Council, have a current procurement strategy, as Robin's just mentioned, and that strategy should outline the approach to Council's transportation activities, so both capital and service related. While it's a mandatory requirement that we have a procurement strategy for transportation, um, that shouldn't be a tick box exercise. So the intent behind the document that we've presented is to demonstrate to NZTA that Council is a safe pair of hands for their funding. Council's procurement activities, so how we spend money, can have an impact on the quality of our capital, um, the maintenance of those assets, and ultimately it can affect the cost of Council services, i.e. rates. Sure. This new Sorry, could you just pull your microphone a little closer? Thank you. We just have the volume up a little bit, it's quite difficult to hear. Yeah, um, can we leave that with the team if it's possible to have the speakers? Thank you. Sorry. So Karen. I'll just. Oh, oh. There we go. <laughs> here we go. Not that loud. Push it away. <laughs> <laughs> Trying again. Is that better? <coughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Carry on. I'm sure they can adjust as you go. Okay. This new strategy encourages a broader view with a focus on public value. So public value um, means that it's not focused only on price, but about the best result based on the life of the goods and works. It includes using resources economically and considering opportunities to contribute to social and environmental outcomes. It also looks at the forward programme of works and the supply market within the region. It's worth mentioning that this procurement strategy is just one piece of a larger um, piece of work. So we've talked about optimising public value, which is in the strategy. We're also looking through some separate work to look at how we can use that to support delivery of council objectives and build capability and capacity internally through procurement and delivery, but also within our supply markets. Uh, based on timings, we did have to meet some quite constrained timings um, from NZTA and NZTA have now seen and endorsed the strategy. So while the intent is to develop a strategy which encompasses more than just um, transportation, we were constrained in this case to focus on transportation activities first, but within the next 12 months, it's hoped that we'll have a, a broader strategy which will look at procurement activities right across council. So, in summary, the recommendation today is that Council endorses this transportation procurement strategy. Any questions? Frank, Councillors, Councillor Simpson. Yeah, I just wanted to get a, a context around, because I sort of, as I read through the document, I struggled to figure out whether it was a strategy or a manual, because it was quite simple around some of the contents and some of the detail involved. Um, so my questions really are the structure, the content, is that a prescripted um, structure and content <coughs> the agency or is that an in-house structure and content? Because if it is in-house, then we actually need to figure out what a strategy is versus what a manual is. So NZTA provide quite um, prescriptive details on what the strategy must contain. There's a wee bit of latitude within what they say just around the context, but in terms of what inputs um, need to go within that document that is prescribed by NZTA. If I, if I may, um, Chair, just um, it, it is a requirement of NZTA that we develop the strategy, but it has to comply with their procurement manual. So you're absolutely right, there is a sort of combination of um, almost operational aspects and policy. 
particularly when we go through, through Madam Chair, particularly when we go through the phase of broadening the horizons of the procurement strategy, it needs to be more strategic um, and probably have this sort of a document sitting under it um, to, to comply with agencies' requirements. Um, but I think we just need to look at that balance of what is a strategy versus what is a procurement manual. We certainly have that opportunity when we're developing our council wide. Uh, obviously, because we get so much funding distance from the agency, it does constrain us to form into their uh, current requirements. And just a final question, thank you for answering those two. Um, there is a, within, the, within the, the document or the report, there's an indication that it's going to be reviewed within 12 months, is that correct? So that's as part of developing the broader strategy. The idea would be to encompass the transportation requirements within that broader strategy, and the intent is to have that completed within the next 12 months. There are a number of, I think, the hangovers from the 2010 document that still stand within here, like references to the long-term council community plan, which don't exist anymore. Um, so I think we need to just tidy some of those things up. But if, if we're going to capture those sorts of changes within the next 12 months to ensure that the next iteration is more, more fully than I'm probably um, what we've got in front of us currently. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Simpson. Any Councillor Crystal? Um, just, ooh, cool. Okay. Right back. Um, in the, um, in the in endorsement letter at the end, it says um, that their maximum term of contract is five years and Napa City Council wants to do nine years. What's the reason for that? Sorry, sorry, Madam Chair. Um, the uh, standard maximum is five years, mm. um, so there are a lot of approved organisations who have longer uh, contract periods. Mm -hmm. um, we only have a, a, a five-year granted contract, um, and we would need to go back to the agency prior to awarding any extensions. So there's no obligation on council to fulfil anything which it can't deliver through the agency. For instance, um, the one of the reasons we were held off from having approval for a longer than five-year contract was because when we awarded that contract, we were still without an up-to-date procurement strategy. Um, so certainly the process that we're going through at the moment, and um, we've had very, very positive feedback from the agency. They were um, really, really complimentary about what we'd done. I think they were expecting sort of last-minute rush, and certainly we were under pressure, but they were really pleased with what we've submitted. Um, and they're very, very comfortable with the way we're heading forwards. Um, if those are subsequently adopted, we just need to um, request an extension um, to that. So it's not a hard and fast policy, but it's not a, a right either. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. With there being no more questions, can I ask for a mover of the paper? I'll move it. Councillor Price, now I have a seconder. Councillor Simpson. Uh, Councillor Price, do you wish to speak to the motion? Okay, I, um, I, I actually haven't got a lot to say. I understand that it is a process that has to be covered. Um, I do understand that you are, are very, very busy. And, um, and the fact is uh, we're reviewing it again in uh, 12 months. Um, the only thing I'd say is it should have been double debated. And, uh, but, yeah, I'm happy to move it forward. Thank you. Councillor Simpson? I obviously second the motion, so therefore I speak in favour of But I am, again, uh, like Councillor Price, expressing my concern that this didn't go through. Can't hear, sorry. Can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> okay. I speak in favour of the, uh, the motion. Am I actually there? Can we just Hello. have a check if Councillor Simpson's microphone? I don't know if it's working. There's no Hello. middle ground on this. No. Perhaps Bori, borrow uh, Councillor Mawson's. <laughs> yeah, while well, seconding the motion and speaking in favour of it, um, I do want to express my concern that this didn't go through the committee processes, um, but it is a robust document. Um, it will need some tidying up over the next 12 months, but I'm happy to move and uh, happy to second and um, speak to the motion. Thank you. Noted, Councillor Simpson and Councillor Price. Do we have any further speakers? 
Um, before I go to a vote, I just want to say, Sharon, thank you um, and Robin for the paper. Um, I was particularly, um, you and I have discussed at length, I suppose, our procurement strategy in the wider council, and um, I just wanted to really flag for council. I think it's um, almost groundbreaking for us to build in um, some 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 well-being based outcomes um, in our procurement and our first procurement strategy looking like this. So that's a really good um, thing for the community to know that when we're procuring uh, and procurement strategies don't always look um, exciting from the out <laughs> from the outset um, but we are also looking at those those social those cultural those environmental outcomes and weighing up where we spend our money um, in the transportation sector as a result of adopting uh, this strategy so, um, <coughs> congratulations on, on what you. I think is a really good first step and down that um, well-being based um, outcomes assessment thank you um, right, with that, and there being no further speakers, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any against? Lovely. Thank you, guys. Thank you. We'll move on to our, uh, item number two, the Māori Committee Meeting Mechanics. Um, and Mr Marshall, our Chief Executive, do you plan to I, speak? I will provide a brief introduction to the background as to why the paper exists at all and in, um, in the pathway here. And... Um, and then Devi will be able to speak to some of the detail in the paper if um, councillors have questions in that regard. I'm just hoping that... Is my mic clear? Right, very good. Um, so the, th this paper arrives here as a result of a series of conversations that have taken place at the Māori Committee around the uh, terms of reference. Uh, so if I step back in time a wee way, uh, the Māori Committee, uh, in terms of being... a uh, um, a legislated uh, committee of council had operated to quite a separate uh, committee and meeting cycle than the rest of council had. So for reasons in the past, it had ended up on a four-week meeting cycle outside of the normal council boundaries, uh, and the minutes of those meetings were reported through to council in the next available council meeting. But it did operate to a four-weekly meeting cycle uh, as opposed to the normal fully integrated committee of council. So in conversations with the Māori Committee members in discussion, we'd started a conversation with them around what the terms of reference were, uh, given our legislative obligations uh, in terms of a standing committee for Māori. And it became clear um, to that committee in those conversations that actually this anomaly of it sitting outside in a separate standalone process really ought to be considered and addressed. Uh, with the original intention being um, following the general philosophy of council to have a double debate on matters, uh, that there was a consideration about how that double debate might be brought into being for the Māori Committee. The original intention behind the committee had been that the Māori Committee would get to see agenda items and be able to offer its advice and comments to full council before council arrived at a final decision in its normal committee cycle. Uh, and so that was the initial conversation that had been had around the Māori Committee um, some meetings ago. Uh, the committee had asked us to address those matters and to come back with a how might it be reintegrated into the process and how might that be considered to give effect to the intention behind a standing Māori Committee so that Council could benefit from that input in its consideration. So that's how the conversation took place. Uh, in order to... Um, give effect to bringing the Māori Committee fully into the six-weekly cycle, um, there requires quite a bit of adjustment in order to do that properly because we are not, in order to allow the Māori Committee to be able to see effectively um, the agenda items that Council was considering and in order for the Māori Committee input to be able to be reflected at the Council table, we, need to, we needed to consider how that might best be done. This paper is that outcome. It has been considered by the Māori Committee in its last meeting, and um, th they understand the difficulties of the administrative processes of local government, um, but that in a general philosophical sense, if Council is wishing to take on board the advice of the Māori Committee and have that properly considered in its construction, then something around these lines really needs to be adopted. And in that regard, then, in their consideration, they fully endorsed the consideration of the mechanics and having that brought through to Council. Uh, as Councillor Price has raised, 
Um, should this have ended up through some other double debate process? Um, perhaps that's a consideration that Council needs to give to, but as a governance matter, as um, Deborah has said, these issues come uh, to full Council in the first instance. This is a governance issue. Uh, it is about the integration of the Māori Committee. Uh, it has had a reasonable consideration over an extended period of time by the Māori Committee. Uh, now, Council is perfectly entitled uh, um, to leave the matter lie on the table so it can give it some further consideration, but that's the background <coughs> Um, that brings us to this point with this paper at this time. So I'm happy for Devi if I've missed anything or you wish to add anything. Um, I'm happy to take uh, questions through you, Madam Chair. I'm guessing that there may be some questions around this one, so I'll provide myself with my own microphone so I can answer them. <laughs> um, yeah, no, and thank you, Keith. I appreciate you providing the background, and I don't really think I have anything to add. It is, um, as he's pointed out, um, uh, there's a lot to do with... Um, making sure that the voice is honoured in a particular way, I suppose, of the Māori Committee. Um, we know those of you that were councillors in the previous triennium know that they did used to meet in the fifth week, um, and so ostensibly they had an overview of all of council reports at that point. Uh, but decisions of council at committees overrode that, um, things coming through direct to council overrode that, um, where they did that and it wasn't necessary. <laughs> um, and often at week five it was too late for them to have any meaningful input. So we're not only, that's why this paper not only proposes to reintegrate them back into the six weekly cycle, but to entirely review that six week cycle to make sure that it's actually a meaningful integration. Thank you, Debbie. I think what we'll do, um, because there is going to be some questions, yeah. is we will take questions uh, followed by discussion before we move anything. Great. Um, do I have any questions? Yes. Councillor Price. <laughs> so I, I've got to make a short statement. I'm taking a leaf out of Uppy's book here. No, discussion actually. is fine. Yeah. So I, I fully understand where you're coming from and fully accept that. Item three, my eyes are not good. A B3, yep. Yeah. I have a lot of difficulty with it. Did the Maori Consultative Committee or the recommendations say that we should remove decisions of councils from standing committees? Because that, to me, sits out with, with lights on it. Because I, I think we've got something wrong if we can just have something sprung on us like that, that we can't... Standing committees can't make a decision of council because we quite often... We'll have them sitting on the papers today. We quite often um, might be a, a gaming grant that comes through that has to be done, and a standing committee gives it a decision of council, and that is going to be removed. To me, it's not right. Yeah, so if I could to... just um, possibly phrase up what Councillor Price has said in the question, and that is, does this override our standing orders and our abilities inside the terms of reference to have decisions of council at committee if that committee chooses? No, it doesn't, and we're happy to um, adjust the wording, um, for example, generally. What we found is that, so decisions of council, um, because earlier, Councillor Price, you were um, also pushing the importance of double debate, and we agree with that. Decisions of council override double debate, um, which we agree has um, opportunity to be a real strength, particularly when we do incorporate the Māori Committee, so you're getting uh, your thinking as a committee, you're getting Māori Committee thinking, and then you're bringing that together into council thinking for a final decision. Decisions of council at committee level um, bypass that process. Um, so that's part of, and bypasses the Māori committee altogether. So there's an element in that recommend, it is an officer's recommendation. Um, the intention is not to override standing orders, so very happy to um, adjust the wording of that to better reflect the intention. Um, the intention is to make sure that um, council as a committee and the Māori committee all have the opportunity to fully think things through to the extent that they can. Um, we recognise that there are, that on occasion, um, decisions of council have been used at standing committees for the purposes of timing. Uh, uh, and we have 
thought that through, and by and large, it does tend to be larger matters that are impacted by that or grants funding, because um, we have had some um, conversations with Antoinette's team around this. Um, and we do anticipate that where required extraordinary meetings could be used to advantage here. Thank you. Thank you. If Mr. I'm right through you, Madam Chair, if the wording is clumsy, we apologise for that, but the intention here is a spirit and intent intention around double debate and input from the Māori Committee. So um, I think there is there is plenty of room for us to be adjusting and for Council to be thinking about the way in which it gives effect to that, but the spirit and intent with this was absolutely behind the double debate process mm -hmm. and ensuring that that stands as per your earlier comments in the meeting, mm -hmm. Councillor Price. Um, and there will always be times when in which urgent decisions come up and are addressed through a different process. But um, as Dever has said, there is the opportunity for uh, <coughs> extraordinary council meetings in order to make sure if we have that double debate, mm. or for relatively minor matters, this, um, we need to adjust the wording here to make sure it doesn't affect it. But this is absolutely about a spirit and intent around the double debate process mm. and the input of the Māori Committee uh, into council's consideration. Uh, Councillor Price, follow-up question, then Councillor Clark. Just, just further to that, what we're doing today is we're removing the double debate on a paper that is deciding on double debating. <laughs> the Maori paper <laughs> is to give them into the system so they can double debate, but we're not double debating it. Mm. So to me, it's a little bit double Dutch. <laughs> um, I, I fully accept the intent. I don't mm. think there's anything. I mean, I personally would like to see that um, removed because... Do we want to have an extraordinary meeting to decide that we can apply for some funding for a Christmas party? No. I just think we're, mate, we're creating a rod to our back. Thank you, Councillor Price. I'll take Councillor Crown's question and maybe you'd like to think about something you propose to move. May I, sorry, before we move on to the next question, um, may I make a comment to that through you, Madam Mayor? Um, the intention is also, um, so we've also in internally um, made some adjustments which the team have been fantastic with around reports planning. Um, so we also anticipate that um, last minute things coming through will actually be driven by external timeframes as opposed to internal timeframes. Thank you, Debbie. Councillor Crown. For you, uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Sorry, it's more of a comment rather than a question That's also, right. um, following the train that Councillor Price has started. Um, so I'm, I'm actually personally quite disappointed that this paper has come to us um, in this way. Um, I would have really liked to have seen it, um, whether it's um, a correct procedurally or not. Um, what we're trying to do here is that spirit and intent and provide um, this committee with a way to feed back to us in a meaningful way. And it feels like it's just getting off on the wrong foot simply because we weren't able to discuss this um, in a workshop or a seminar um, privately amongst ourselves first. Um, yeah, I've, I think it's a fantastic idea to have them involved more and for us to recognise the input of our Māori committee, but the way in which it has come to us, um, yeah, I personally find very disappointing. Noted. Thank you, Councillor Crown. Are there any other questions or discussion? Councillor Simpson, then Councillor Brown. So my, my question, it's been a very long time since I've had or attended a Maori committee uh, meeting. Um, my question is, does this committee, and, and my questioning so that you're aware of where I'm heading with this, is associated with the six weekly cycle and programme which has been significantly impacted. Um, my question is, does this committee um, receive new reports, i.e. that have not been to committees before, in other words, uh, the need for an agenda time frame um, which is impacting on other current standing committees, are they receiving new reports that need time and effort and preparation and, and that sort of carry on, or do they simply in the current context receive the agendas from other committee meetings um, to consider? Uh, and provide perspective on, um, which I fully endorse. I think it's a, a great opportunity to bring them fully into the cycle. But I'm more, more questioning about the need for them to disrupt in such a significant way 
In other words, we're seeing one of the, two of the standing committees are now shifted from the second week of our cycle to the first week of the cycle, which means they immediately follow the week after a council meeting. Um, and then, again, the other two committees have been moved a week forward. Um, so we're seeing a significant disruption to work programs and patterns, and I'm just questioning whether there is substantial enough new information going to the Maori Committee that needs that level of time and effort um, to adjust our entire program. I think the uh, location in the program is fine. I think it is, is appropriate that, that, that they provide us some perspective before we meet as a council. Um, but I'm just looking at the program holistically and saying we're seeing a significant impact in the way we're going to be having staff involved in preparing reports to meet that first week deadline immediately after a, a council meeting week. Thank you. Uh, DG, so, so just to well summarise back, my question yes. is about the level of new content that yep. is going to the Maori Committee. Yes, yeah. and, and the appropriateness of the placing of it in, week, in yep. the week it is. Yep. Sure. Um, yes, I can take that. Thank you. Um, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, they do receive their own new reports as well as all of the uh, agenda items that will be coming through. Um, officers are preparing reports, if I can just speak to that briefly. Um, they are preparing reports um, for a draft agenda that's due two weeks in advance of the final agenda, so all of the time frames get pulled out. Um, so they're actually preparing the reports for the next committee round before the council meeting uh, where decision is taken, just um, so that there's some timing there. But yeah, the, um, the Māori committee do consider uh, all reports, well they have the opportunity to consider and discuss all reports that come through the standing committees as well as their own. Mm. Perhaps it's also worth adding to that. Um, uh, in a way, it's a timely revision of the timing of the entire process because actually this provides a greater onus on forward planning for council papers mm -hmm. beyond the, the current cycle and the cycle after that because of those time frames. So, so one of the added benefits of this process is actually it provides a greater forward planning for papers coming um, up through the committee cycle generally. Great. Thank you, Mr Marshall. Councillor... Brown and then Councillor Taylor. Thank you. Um, I have three questions. Um, they're all around how we as a council can receive and digest or receive the information, the recommendations from the model committee in a digestible way. Um, so my first two are reasonably straightforward. Um, can we have the Māori committee meetings in our calendar at the moment? I don't think I'm receiving the invites. So. Uh, yes, um, sorry, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, yes, we have um, had that email conversation with the Mayor and Deputy Mayor over this week, um, and they will be sent out as an optional um, attendance for all councillors. Brilliant. Um, are the meetings live streamed? No, not, uh, not currently. That would need to be a decision of um, that comes from council as to whether they want to uh, integrate that or not, um, factoring the costs involved. Are they recorded at all? Uh, yes, question. they are for administrative purposes. Um, they do expect quite a high, um, a more in-depth level of minutes taking, so we're just working through with them as to the, the setting there. Okay. Uh, and then my final question is, uh, it was mentioned that the method for us to receive the feedback is to read the minutes from that meeting. And um, to me, that seems quite passive and kind of disjointed as the minutes come out separate to our agendas. Um, so, no? no? Um, I can, sorry, if I can just um, speak to that straight away. <laughs> uh, uh, this is part of the reason why there, um, is, depending on where council gets to with this today um, in its discussion, this is one of the reasons why there is going to be a small time lag. Um, in terms of implementing anything. Uh, councillors that were here in the previous training will be aware um, that our Info Council, Info Council is the program that um, helps us to automate, by and large, um, our agenda production. Um, and it's actually the, um, this functionality that led Info Council itself um, to say that our requirements almost breach the <laughs> levels of human understanding. Um, so what happens with the Māori Committee in this type of setting, which we don't have at the moment, but would reactivate um, if council requires it, uh, that the agenda, so the information, including all the reports of all of the standing committees, are pulled into the Māori Committee agenda. So that's um, they will also have 
obviously access um, to your agendas immediately via online, but they will have every report fully in their agendas. So that's why um, they are able to discuss or decide to discuss anything at their own hui. Um, they don't need to make that decision prior. And any feedback or recommendations that they choose to uh, provide on papers that are then brought to council are actually captured. So the minutes or the portion of the minutes, um, what we call at the meeting of the Māori committee are, and the recommendation are fed automated into the council agenda. So it's actually a part, it's not a separate document, it's integrated into the agenda. Perfect, that's where I was hoping we were heading. Yeah. So just to clarify, <laughs> yep. in our papers, will it be one of the sections, Māori Committee mm. com Comments Recommendations? Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Yeah, and you'll see that, um, just reflecting back on Councillor Simpson's question, where that particular committee has had new reports, uh, they will drop into the, those new re um, reports that have come through with their recommendations will drop into the council agenda as part of the standing committee's information that's brought through, but they will also have a recommendation against uh, all other pieces that they've chosen to make one on. Thank you. So. Um, Councillor Taylor, then Councillor Bogue. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, like Councillor Price, I um, thoroughly endorse the intent of what we're doing. Um, mine is probably a, might seem trivial question, but in uh, part two of the recommendation where uh, Māori committee members are invited to attend workshops, um, we currently hardly fit into the room where we have our workshops, so <laughs> is it the intention that all workshops will be held here? Uh, through you, um, Madam Chair, as part of this, uh, we will need to look at our venues overall. Um, if council proceeds with this and there are the changes to the timing of the standing committee, we will be liaising with regional council around what is available, but we are aware that um, through COVID and through their own hefty meeting schedule, um, that at this point we may not be able to integrate fully or at all with their venue. Um, so we will be looking across the board. Obviously, um, we don't want to stymie external revenue coming into the conference um, centre budgets. So we are very aware of that. Um, and there are other council facilities that we might be able to use. So we will be... Sorry, that's a very long answer to a short <laughs> question. But um, we won't ne we won't be um, necessarily using a Kateri immediately, depending on the numbers of people that we've got. We will be looking across all our facilities to best effect. And, and I guess it's fair to say, by way of a follow-up to that, if, if we think about a number of the workshop sessions that we've had over the last wee while, they've been quite crowded anyway by virtue of, so it, it's always dependent on topic and the number of presentations and the matters under consideration right now. So mm -hmm. I think Ikateri is already under pressure uh, as a venue, irrespective of any changes we might consider around the Māori Committee. Thank you. Councillor Bogue. Um, yes, um, as a senior councillor who's attended many Māori committee yes. meetings over the years, um, I really appreciate the work that's gone and the thought that's gone into this paper in terms of um, revamping, <coughs> revising, improving our relationship, basically, um, with the Māori committee. But um, in discussion with Councillor Price, I'd like to foreshadow um, a, a, a remit, a re resolution um, that the resolution be tabled, the report and resolution be tabled, and there's a little bit more to it than that in terms of further action and, and in terms of a workshop um, to discuss it um, with the Māori Committee, but I have the wording here, but just to foreshadow that we would like to do that um, to progress this. It's, it's excellent that we're discussing it, but it would be great if we had the Māori Committee here with us to talk it through and further develop that relationship so we're all happy with it. Thank you, Councillor Bogue. I'll take further questions and yep. then I'll come back to you, uh, Councillor McGrath. Through the Chair. Um, just seeking a little bit of clarification on new reports going direct to the Māori Committee. Well, for double debating purposes, will they then go through the next standing, through to a next standing committee or will they go direct to formal council? As through you, Madam Chair, they would go direct to council. The council wouldn't have the opportunity to double debate 
or council laws wouldn't have the opportunity to double debate those, those recommendations. That is correct. Just with the note that, of course, you have the ability to lay any items on the table. You do, and it essentially provides the Māori Committee with, sorry, through you, Madam Chair, it essentially provides the Māori Committee with the same standing as a standing committee. Okay, if there be no further questions or discussion, um, Councillor Bogle, Councillor Price, I understand you have something you would like to move. Uh, Councillor Bogue, she's uh, uh, written a far better document than <laughs> I would ever write, <laughs> and it's probably a lot longer than I would ever write. <laughs> Get ready. I've got a written copy of it here for the staff. Um, the, the resolution is that this report and recommendations... Do you want me to read it slowly? Yeah, yeah. perhaps slowly for Sheree would okay. be appreciated. Do you want me to read it quickly and then slowly? <laughs> that this report and recommendations be laid on the table in order for Council to consider the intent and implication of the report. At a council workshop, to which the Māori committee is or are invited. So I'm moving that. Do I have a seconder? I'll second that. Councillor Price. Maxine, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, I think we've had a good discussion around this. Uh, people, we agree that it's great to um, improve the status and relationship with the Māori Committee and appreciate all the work that's gone into that. There are obviously a few glitches that Council's not comfortable with today and I really think that um, we would get the best possible outcome um, if we have a discussion with that involves not only staff, and each other, but the Māori Committee as well, so we can come to some sort of agreement and the best way to move forward in strengthening our relationship. Thank you. Councillor Price, you wish to speak? Yeah, I just um, I agree with Councillor Bogan. I think that um, the, the intent of this is outstanding, and what we're trying to achieve is outstanding, but I think it needs a, a little bit of debate, and maybe we don't need to sit in public and decide what size room we need to have for it, and we can sort a few things like that out. So... Um, and I think it'll I think it'll fall into place. I don't think there's any hard questions. Just a matter of a bit of discussion. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to the motion on the table? And uh, perhaps we could have uh, the motion again, but we'll do that after Councillor Crown. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I'm speaking in support of the um, amended uh, motion, mostly because um, what my understanding that the spirit and intent of this is actually about. Um, giving meaning to a true partnership with our Māori committee. And um, if they're not here um, to be part of that discussion, then, um, like I said before, it's probably not starting off on the right foot. So, yeah, speaking in support of the amendment motion. Thank you, Councillor Crown. Um, could we have the motion uh, either up on the board? Cherie's going to do that, so we can just have a last look at it before we put that. Your permission, Madam Chair, can I just also add uh, a comment? Absolutely. Councillor Tuppany. Um, so notwithstanding the comments that have already been made by our colleagues, um, I'd like to suggest that perhaps rather than calling a separate meeting and inviting the Māori Committee to come and join us, they do have currently timetabled meetings. And as councillors, we have the opportunity to attend Māori Standing Committee, so perhaps we could look to an opportunity where we might move this conversation to their forum and have it with them there. It's a suggestion, that's all I'm saying, rather than calling a separate meeting, noticing some of the non-verbal cues. Um, but other than that, I'm completely uh, supportive of the amended amendment to the uh, motion and I appreciate the report and the work that the staff have done in bringing this to council <coughs> attention and look forward to how we might reshape the beginning of this conversation. So, uh, Councillor Tuppany, do you are you proposing an amendment to the wording for the mover and seconder to consider? Could I comment on his 
amendment? No. No. It doesn't specify there where the meeting will be held or when or how. So it just says that we should get together. So uh, I'm just inviting that at some stage we might consider those options and what they might look like. Lovely, thank you. Councillor Bogue. No, I was just going um, to say that um, it would be a good opportunity for perhaps this would be the first workshop that we have invited the Māori Committee to and this is something that um, is part of this partnership. Um, so it would be an opportunity for us to start the ball rolling in that way rather than us all coming to their meeting and hijacking that um, or taking it over or whatever. If we had a workshop and we were you know, very enthusiastic about inviting them to discuss this partnership, um, I would prefer that to um, us bringing it to, to one of their meetings, you know, as long as it's set up in such a way that we are you know, equal partners in the discussion um, and that they have, you know, adequate input um, before and during that workshop. So perhaps yeah. through um, through to your resolution, we could just give the guidance to staff that would be happy for the the chairs. Um, so Mia Wise and Chad to discuss the best mechanism to have the conversation. Absolutely, great idea. Just as a piece of guidance to that. Right. Um, there being no further discussion, um, we have the motion on the board, so I'll read, I'll read that. Um, that this report and recommendations be laid on the table in order for Council to consider the intent and implication of the report at a Council workshop to which the Māori Committee are invited. Um, we have a mover and a seconder already, and there being no further discussion, I will put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any against? Carried. Thank you, councillors. Thank you, DV. Um, so our next item uh, is the local governance statement updates. <coughs> and DV, I assume you are also going to speak to us about this one. I am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if you'll just bear with us two seconds, uh, we're just going to circulate a proposed update to the officer's recommendation. I'll just talk to this one very briefly. As I mentioned earlier, um, and as you know from our first introduction with this council to the local governance statement in early March, um, it is a requirement under the Local Government Act um, that councils have a local governance statement uh, which covers specific information. Uh, it is a living document and we agreed with council on the 12th of March when you first adopted or received this document that when um, noting that it was a live docu document, when there were more major changes or an accumulation of larger changes that we would bring it back through to council for visibility. Um, prior to republishing that to the web so that you're aware of um, what's been going on. So that's what we're doing today. And there have been a number of changes since the 12th of March. Um, and I'll just run briefly through the officer's recommendation because that does sort of highlight the main changes that have taken place in that time period. Um, so the Mayor has made some proposed updates to the councillor portfolios. Uh, so Councillor Crystal um, moving into focusing on tourism and council facilities. Uh, councillor McGrath um, adding a focus on city <laughs> services to his existing portfolio of child friendly city. And Councillor Crown um, moving into a focus on economic development. Uh, the Arts Advisory Panel had asked for a further elected member to be appointed uh, there, so Councillor Crystal has also been proposed for that role. Uh, there has been some additional information to the terms of reference for the hearing committee uh, proposed to be added in that interim period for some clarification around uh, the delegations when things come through to... Um, particularly um, to the hearings committee around the consideration of tenders. There is, I understand, um, some further updates to that particular terms of reference being worked on uh, from a more regulatory site, uh, which will come through at a later date. 
uh, <laughs> we finally managed to, and um, ap- apologies to Sports Hawks Bay and to the Sports Council, but we finally managed to unpick what was happening there with that appointment <laughs> uh, and had a lovely conversation um, and email from Mark Aspton. Very much appreciated, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, we did. We have noted. So there is now overt recognition of the status of Te Tiriti o Watangi. Uh, so this was something that was specifically raised at the meeting in March. Um, so that is now um, particularly referenced in a few places throughout the document, uh, as discussed with council. And another thing that was raised at that meeting on the 12th of March was the inclusion of information around the sister cities. So while this isn't a requirement under the legislation, it's a fantastic place, um, as Councillor Simpson pointed out at the time, uh, to um, make public information around the sister cities that we have in the relationship. So that has been included. Uh, And there are... um, so essentially the terms of reference for the Māori Committee is a work in progress with the members of the Māori Committee, um, but there were a couple of matters that we just wanted to make clearer at this point, and that's in relation to remuneration uh, factors around the Māori Committee. So I'll just run through those really briefly, if I may. Um, and that is the reason for the updated um, officer's recommendation. There's been some discussion with um, the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor recently about how... Um, the intent um, of including Māori committee members in all council workshop invites can be appropriately um, addressed through remuneration. Uh, So actually, firstly, before I get to that though, um, so point G, um, you'll notice that we are asking for an endorsement to increase the remuneration for the Māori committee chair. Uh, per attended Māori committee meeting or workshop. Uh, so, and when you adopted the governance structure um, at the end of last year, there was also an increase to the per attended meeting uh, or workshop rate for Māori committee members, um, which hadn't gone up for a wee while prior to that. But we are proposing, um, it was based on some a fantastic work that the principal Māori advisor had done, making sure that we were checking where we sat regionally and in relation to comparative councils. Uh, and the proposal, uh, which wasn't picked up at that time, um, but is being asked for now, is to increase the chair's rem to reflect the the difference in their um, responsibility then. So that's G. Uh, H points out that... Uh, Māori committee members are now paid, so they are remunerated for all Māori committee meetings and workshops attended, uh, where previously, and by that I mean in the previous triennium, uh, they were remunerated only for Māori committee meetings. That tended to be because they didn't actually uh, really have workshops, and obviously, uh, as you're aware through the recent discussion, um, we fully intend to um, integrate them to the best that we can in terms of information sharing. So that's a really note. Um, Because we want to um, reflect and respect the time appropriately that they would be giving to council workshops, which are discretionary in attendance for them, uh, that's where the conversation has sat recently about um, how best to reflect that. Uh, The current proposal, um, which... The Mayor has indicated by email a a level of comfort with um, is that where uh, Māori committee members attend council workshops, so not their own, that they would be remunerated for that at a rate of $200 gross per half day. So um, essentially we're thinking half days as a block of anything, no matter how many workshops are booked in a block between 8 to 12 noon and then 1 to 5, that they would be remunerated for a morning block and an afternoon block, as it were. Uh, we did work out, um, so this is based on a to- uh, treating their 400 per meeting essentially as a daily total for discretionary attendances. Um, I did do a few calculations, and when you break that down by hour for the approximate number of workshops, it works out actually about the same. And we're proposing the 200 per half day, as that might be um, a little bit easier to administrate, to be honest. (laughs) 
uh, but obviously, um, is this a change um, open to discussion and debate? Mm. Thank you, Debbie. Do I have any questions or discussion? Uh, Councillor Brown? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, just a clarification on that, how that half day would work. A lot of our seminars run from 10 till 3. Does that then cover two half day blocks? Yeah, it would. Okay. Uh, yes, um, sorry, through you, um, Madam Chair, yes, it would, um, because while that is typically the case, um, we are moving into, well, you've experienced what it's like with an annual plan, and we are moving into um, long-term plan preparation, um, and we are experiencing a spike in ad hoc workshops, um, which you experienced recently with a zero break day. I do apologise for that. <laughs> So it just um, breaking it into uh, the half-day blocks, regardless of the number of workshops that are booked in there, just makes things easier. Yeah. Thank you. Do I have any further questions or discussion? Uh, Councillor McGrath? Yep. Um, just through the chair, does the remuneration authority have any information or say over these types of... Bits? No? Uh, no, through um, so through the chair, the remuneration authority is responsible for uh, setting the total remuneration for mayors and the partial pool remuneration for councils, um, which then allocate those across their council laws. So elected members, they deal with elected members. Um, appointed members um, <coughs> are remunerated or not, as the case may be, internally. Yep. And just a, 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 another question, if I may. Um, we have other standing, or we have other committees that have a, appointed uh, people on, such as the audit and risk, um, <coughs> some of our grants committees and district licensing. Are they all funded as well, or is? Uh, yep, I can speak to that. Uh, so yes, the uh, the external members of the audit and risk committee are remunerated separately. Uh, elected members, obviously, that's incorporated as part of their roles and responsibilities under their salaries. Uh, and yes, there are also appointed members to other um, subcommittees, and their uh, per meeting uh, remuneration was in also increased at the same time as the Māori Committee was at the end of last year, so they were all brought in line with one another. Mm, great question, thanks. Okay, there being no further questions or discussion, would anyone like to move the officer's revised recommendation? Um, we can put it on the board if that would be helpful. Uh, Maxine, I saw you as a mover. I, I think, Cherie, we're all right because we have the handout. Thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor Bogue. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Brown. Councillor Bogue, do you wish to speak to the motion? Yes, uh, thank you very much for these revisions and um, I'm really pleased to see the remuneration for the Māori Committee um, there in writing as many of them have to take time off work to attend our workshops and if, if and their meetings and if we'd like them to attend our workshops, which we do, then it's only right that they have an opportunity to recoup the money that they would otherwise be earning, part of it anyway, from their from their. Um, external employment. So thank you very much for um, sending this out and being open to the suggestions that we brought in. Mm -hmm. um, and I look forward to seeing the uh, totally um, revised copy of the governance statement with my new photograph in yes. it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I, I did mean to say, sorry, through um, you, Madam Chair, I did appreciate your email the other day. So thank you, we have the, made those updates. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thank you. Um, yes, I support the motion, and I think um, it's brilliant that we're uh, remunerating the Māori Committee more fully in their role. I think uh, in our society, uh, money is a proxy for value, and I think everyone around the table values the contribution that the Māori Committee bring, and this is another way of us um, being able to showcase that. Thank you. Are there any other speakers? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Thank you, DV. Thank you all. Uh, we will move on to item four, the last of our um, open new items, being the New Year's Eve funding application. 
And who's going to speak to this for us? Um, Belinda. Welcome, Belinda. Cool. Hi. Um, so I'm. Um, can you hear me? Uh, no, you're very <laughs> bring light. it forward. Maybe bring oh, it right forward and speak right into it for us. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I'm here on behalf of Kevin. Um, he was not able to come um, this morning. So basically we're just putting forward um, recommendations for external funding to um, fund the New Year's Eve event, which is always very popular and brings in a, a huge crowd. Um, we've raised the amounts that we're applying to a couple of the major uh, app, uh, sorry, funders this year. Due to COVID, there's a little bit of uncertainty into how much money's going to be available. Uh, and this allows us to get a second bite at the apple, so to speak, if our first funding application is declined. So that is why um, there's sort of an increase in those. Um, we normally get around 30 to 35,000 from external funding, which is really good. So we're hoping that we are able to achieve that again this year. Great, thank you. Do we have any uh, questions on the paper? No. Uh, Councillor Tuppany. Are there any, uh, not around the details, but just around um, the event planning coming up, are there any planned or initial significant changes to the expected delivery of that community event? The question comes from, given that we're post-COVID and we're looking to rebuild some synergy and some vitality in the city, whether or not there'll be added components of delivery that might mm. be looking at um, bolstering that level of vitality within our city. Mm. Yeah. I'm um, sorry, I can't answer that because um, Kevin is in direct contact with the contractor who um, is in charge of all that. I, th I think from past history, they normally like to get as many local artists as they can, preferably rather than outside artists. And that has been a trend for the last two or three years, so I don't see that that would be any different. If there are any indicators, if you could let Kevin know to send a message back this way. Will do. Yep. Thank you, mm. Councillor Tuppany. Can um, I just ask a question? Yeah, um, Councillor Boak. Yes, no, I appreciate this opportunity to apply for funding. Um, my suggestion is that perhaps next year, because it's a set date, New Year's Eve, that this request comes first to the Napier People and Places Committee, um, and that it's, I don't know if you're the right person to talk to, but if it could be put on the calendar to come to <coughs> the Standing Committee and then just mm. brought up to the Council after that. Um, it, it normally does, but it was just a due to timing this year that because of COVID and we were just not too sure what was even going to happen, okay. how long we were going to be in lockdown or anything. So it was it was just due to timing. It normally would go through. Um, and we, it's had to come to cancel this time because we want to start applying for our funding in August. Thank you. OK, thank you. Noted, Councillor Bogue. Um, if there are no further questions, hands not up. Um, do I have a mover for the recommendation to approve the applications to external funders for the 2021 New Year's Eve event? Councillor McGrath. And Councillor Mawson. Sorry, Councillor Crystal. Uh, <laughs> Councillor McGrath, do you wish to speak to the motion? Just through the chair. Um, look, it's, it's a wonderful family event, um, although it, the, the fireworks do go off at, at midnight. It's just Good fun, and uh, if I have to run the child-friendly lens across the portfolio, um, this is awesome. And people are calling for fireworks to be to be in, in formal settings like this, and this is this is a great opportunity and, and good fun. Thank you, Councillor McGrath. Councillor Mawson. Certainly, running the the child-friendly lens over it, they did have two and one at nine o'clock just for the children to have. So brilliant fun. event, and fully supported. Oh, and adults, of course, enjoy that as well. Right. <laughs> um, 
Would anyone else like to speak in support of the paper? <laughs> right. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Thank you, Belinda. Thank you. <laughs> all right. We now move into the reports and recommendations from our standing committees. Um, what I propose to do is take uh, them in blocks of committee, uh, but if anyone would like to speak to any of the, the papers independently as I move, move through them, please just flag that and we'll, we'll, we will stop. Uh, so reports from the Audit and Risk Committee held on the 12th of June, we have the Wasteful Water Outfall Report, Summary of the Napier Water Safety Plans Risks, our Health and Safety Report, the Draft Annual Plan 2021, uh, Sensitive Expenditure, Mayor and Chief Executive, External Accountability, Investment and Debt Report, and the Risk Management Report of 20 June. Um, Councillor Simpson would like to move those. Do I have a seconder? Uh, Councillor Taylor, any discussion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Uh, we'll then move on to the reports from my committee, the future Napier Committee, on the 18th of June. Uh, so we had our Building Act changes and our Resource Consent Activity Report. Do I have a mover for those? Councillor Crystal and Councillor Tarpany. Any discussion? No. No. <laughs> All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Reports from Maxine, the Napier People and Places Committee, held on the 2nd of July. Uh, we have the Library Membership Policy. Uh, do I have a mover? Councillor Bogue in a seconder. Councillor Brown, any discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Carried. Reports from the Prosperous Napier Committee held on the 2nd of July. We have our Licence to Occupy Recreation Reserve for the Sunday Market and the Hawke's Bay Disla Disaster Relief Trust, the council controlled organisation. Uh, Councillor Taylor moved, Councillor Simpson seconded. Uh, any discussion? There being none, um, all in favour please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Um, now we have our reports under delegated authority. So we have documents executed under seal, uh, tenders let and resource consent. So I'll take all three together if we have a mover. Uh, Councillor Price and Councillor Tuppany. Uh, any discussion to matters in those three? There being none, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Carried. Um, we then have one minor matter uh, to discuss to close out the end of our public meeting. Um, and I'd just like to say for the public that minor matters are able to be uh, discussed and uh, no, no discussion, no recommendation and no decision on minor matters um, are to be made. So, um, Councillor McGrath, would you like to raise your minor matter? Uh, yes, um, a while back the Mariwa toilet block was run into by a vehicle and damaged and is currently closed, or I assume it's still closed. I'm just after an update of whether it's been assessed uh, safety-wise and whether we're looking to reopen them in the near future. Lovely. Thank you, Councillor McGrath. I understand, John, you're prepared to answer? Uh, certainly through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, the toilet box were uh, hit by a vehicle. I think it was a stolen vehicle last weekend. Uh, it has now been the damage to Block has now been assessed by the uh, the insurers, uh, and a structural assessment uh, will need to be undertaken, and that will be managed by the insurance assessors as well. So, um, Ryan, I see you're in the room. Do you have any dates around when the insurance company will have the structural assessors there? No, I don't. Understand. Yeah, so as you say, it's now out of our hands. Ryan. So, uh, yeah, still still closed. Still waiting for that structural assessment to determine um, if we can partially open to provide some service. 
the Parks and Reserves team uh, are dropping notices um, with the businesses around there and are putting up signage about where the closest toilets are, uh, which are um, Maria Shops and um, Maria, uh, sorry, Mariah Millie Shops and Maria Park. Is there any further discussion? Thank you, Councillor McGrath. Um, do I have a mover to move into public excluded? Councillor Mawson? Councillor Crown? Um, all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Thank you, everyone.